But um, yeah. over to you, Matt. Okay. Thank you for joining right. us. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, my name's Matt, and uh, I seem to be a, a coin designer. I'm going to sort of separate this out into three sort of different, different bits, really. I'm going to give you a bit of an idea about my background and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, because although uh, I'm fairly well known for producing coin designs, it's you know, only a fraction of what I do, so I think it's only fair to give you sort of a full picture there, really. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit how I got into coin design and where it's gone from. So those are the sort of the three chapters to this, really. So these are the designs which I'm responsible for, and you might have seen these. You've probably used them today. You've probably got them in your pockets. They'll be the shiny ones in your, in your change. Um, and this came about as a result of a public competition launched by the Royal Mint to find designs for the, the reverses of the circulating coinage. The reason was that the current issue had been in use since the 70s when decimalisation came in, and the Royal Mint felt it was time to sort of, you know, introduce a fresh design set, and historically that's been the, the case. Um, so they launched a public competition to find the designs. I was one of 4,000 people who submitted designs, and eventually they found their way onto the backs of the coins. But I'm going to get onto that in a little minute or so. So day to day, I co-run a design studio called Bison Bison. It's small, it's just generally there's two of us, it all sort of depends on the workload, so sometimes we have freelancers, sometimes we have an intern. Um, today it was just two of us. Um, and we do all kinds of stuff, so we do a lot of identity work, logo and identity work. Um, we do some work for, for print and, and digital work as well. So we do some, some websites, some e-commerce work, some iPad apps, some mm. all kinds of things. And it, I think that's the sort of the main takeout for me, for you know, the benefit of a small studio, is you get involved in all kinds of different disciplines. So we might have a client that we're doing an identity for, and they say, oh, you know, we're going to produce a short bit of film. We're looking for someone who can sort of direct it or edit it or something like that. And we're normally fairly vocal, and we say, oh, we'll give it a go. How hard can it be? So we end up doing all kinds of different things, and that's fantastic. That's what I enjoyed doing when I was at uni, and I've been quite fortunate that I've been able to, to enjoy doing all kinds of different things since. We've even done some sort of um, script writing for radio ads and all kinds of things. It's just, it's brilliant. But the coin project started out, you know, way back before I set up my own studio. It was sort of back in 2005, so just when I got back from a, a year of travelling, I felt quite hungry and thirsty to get, you know, into, into the design world. And um, I got sent this, this brief through that was launched by the Royal Mint, and um, my mate said, hey, this looks really interesting, you should give it a go, you know, how about telephones through the ages as an idea or something like that. Um, but it, it, it's, it's interesting, and it got me sort of talking with my mum and dad, and they were quite into the idea, and, and I was enthusiastic to give it a go, so that's what I did. So the brief was to find designs for the whole set, not just a commemorative 50p, not just a commemorative £2, but the future sort of set of coinage. So it was massively exciting. Um, the brief was really thorough and it had all kinds of guidance as to what sort of is required technically, but it didn't preclude people who didn't really have much of a background in design to, to give it a go and it didn't stop me having a go. You know, my background is, is, is nothing, you know, I don't know about coin design. I didn't know about coin design until this, this brief came through. So the brief was fairly accessible, encouraging people to have a go and to submit designs in whatever format they felt necessary. It was fairly broad, sort of gave ideas on uh, heraldry or fauna and flora, uh, geographic features, British achievements, this kind of thing. So just generally the theme of, of Britishness really was, was needed to, to, to appear on these coins. And I thought because, you know, it was an opportunity to design a cohesive six set of coins that a sort of a cohesive single design would work quite well. Initially that kind of, you know, this kind of idea came to mind where you've got a composite landscape and you've got, you know, different geographical features or different landmarks that bleed into one another and run their way across the, the landscape of the coins. And I, I like the idea of interactivity that you can place them together and create the order and it introduces a bit of, a bit of fun. So that was an idea that I was pretty excited about, but I didn't think that this was quite right. I thought that the, the approach was quite linear. The arrangement of those six coins in the end seemed a little bit unsatisfying, and to me, I wondered if they could be a bit denser. Um, 
I should sort of say that the design needed to represent the UK in its entirety as well, so it had to represent England, Ireland, Scotland, or England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And that was quite tricky with six coins, so that's a sort of a, another reason why the composite image seemed to float quite well for me. Um, so I went back to the brief. Heraldry was, was mentioned. I didn't really know much about heraldry, so I did a bit of a bit of research and found that there's the, the shield of the Royal Arms, that design there, which you've probably seen. It, you know, it's involved in the, in the masthead for the times. It's used on the sort of the Queen's emblem. If the Queen prefers a particular type of mattress to sleep on or pillows or whatever, you know, that you have the sort of the, the Royal sort of seal of approval there on those items. So that's the shield of the Royal Arms and it represents the UK. So it seemed perfect. It's heraldry and coinage is you know, is, is rooted in heraldry. Heraldry is symbolic of the UK as a whole. And it's, it has this nice sort of dense shape for me that I thought could work. So that's sort of what I, what I did. So this was a sort of the first physical manifestation of this idea. I found that image. I printed it out. I pieced the coins over it. I drew around it, cut them out, and I thought it could work. So I didn't sort of send anything into the, the mint at this point. I did a bit of research trying to find the best sort of examples of heraldry that I could find. Again, looking at the brief, it sort of cited different heraldic books to have a look at. So I thought, well, you know, the, the, the lines are quite good in this example, so I'll yoink a bit of that. And I quite like the way that the heart works there, so I'll use a bit of that as well. The, uh, the fleur-de-lis looks great there and, and certain things. So it was a bit, a bit of sort of detective work and trying to piece together the best examples of the individual elements that I could find. And this is what I sent in as the first design stage. And it's, as you can see, it's, it's incredibly rough. It's just linear. It's, you know, you might as well have sort of drawn it out with a pencil, really. Um, but the Royal Mint saw um, the spark of an idea in that, and they saw it had potential, and they invited me to, to reply and, and to develop the idea as, as time went on. So initially, I think there were 4,000 designs that were submitted and they compiled a short list, they whittled it down to perhaps 100 and then down to 50 and to 10 and to 5 and to 3 and 1 and, and, and so on. So that was the process that I went through with them. I arranged the coins in this way really because I found that the, the larger coins were better placed on the corners. Because you've got all this sort of you know lost space here, you needed a fairly generous coin to be able to eat into a considerable amount of the of the shield, so that's why the, the larger ones are there. And it just so happened in this iteration of the design, I, I kind of preferred the, that arrangement, but it did change a little bit. So the process was, w was fairly intense. I'd be trying to kind of look at the, the details of the design to try and make sure that, you know, I was drawing the animals as best I could. I was doing this in um, Illustrator. Um, later sort of bring it in, bringing it into Photoshop to sort of simulate a, a three-dimensional effect and things like that. But this is the, the blueprint, the wireframes really, that's at the core of the, uh, the visual. So I was zoomed in to sort of, you know, 2,000% size and messing around with the nuances of the mouth and things like that and having to sort of also think about, you know, how does that element of design fit within the coin itself and also how does that coin fit within its neighbours so there was a constant sort of you know macro and micro zooming into the detail and looking at the bigger picture and seeing if I had that balance so this is how I'd, I'd visualize it from then I wouldn't send you I wouldn't send the raw mint this kind of thing I'd, I'd be sending them this kind of thing really um, and it was great because they have a, an advisory committee a, a set of probably about sort of 12 or 14 people who are fairly senior in different sort of disciplines, not just necessarily creative ones, but, but also sort of, you know, uh, heraldic sort of experts and uh, people who are interested in all kinds of different things like architecture and things. But I got some useful feedback from a typographer called Stephen Raw, uh, and he was able to sort of educate me about what happens when, when, you know, when coins are produced, specifically what happens to type under pressure and how metal you know, metal is liquid under that pressure, really. It's forced into, um, into a specific shape by the pressure of the die. So giving me some advice as to how to sort of, you know, adjust the, the counters of the characters or how to um, echo the, the circular edge of the coin with, with adjusting the, 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 the bars and things like that of the, of the type and, and trying to sort of bed it in as best I could with the, with the circular shape of the coin. And it got to a... 
sufficiently small shortlist for sculptors to be um, employed to realise our you know, two-dimensional di designs in three-dimensional form. And these were produced by a sculptor called John Bergdahl, who's done some you know, weird and wonderful projects. He worked for the Australian Mint for a while, but he's also been involved in the production of, um, you know, like tobacco packaging or, or cigar packaging, which has, you know, the, the sort of contoured front, um, sort of, you know, working with, with metal or that. So he'd produced these plaster models, sort of about that sort of diameter, as, you know, the 10 pence piece would be about that sort of size. He'd take my designs as, as best I could supply them and in, enlarge them to the size he knew he needed to work out and then he'd work into it and it was amazing because he was able to do so much that I wasn't able to, to do you know I could only get my illustrator and photoshop files so far but he was able to work in by hand and add details that I wasn't able to to visualize so you know you got bits of sort of muscle mass and rib cage there and and the hair and little you know dots on the snout where the where the whiskers might be and all sorts of things like that and that was that was amazing and for the first time this was a long process. The whole process was about 18 months, but it was probably about, about a year, I suppose, before I first saw the designs in 3D, and that was amazing, because you just had them in your mind for so long, and all of a sudden you, you saw what they were, were, were like as three-dimensional objects, and that was so exciting. So the process moving on from there is an interesting one, a super technical one. These are, are scanned. This is, this is a, a, a physical scanner which with a head on it which would traverse the coin working fairly slowly it might t might take a few hours might take half a day or so but it would record the relief uh, and from there you could manipulate it on on computer so if there were certain things in the design that the um, the engraving department at the Royal Mint thought there might be some sort of technical issues when it comes to producing dyes like the level of relief being too high at a certain area they would they would you know be able to manipulate that the sort of the, the top left hand corner was one such sort of example. I think they, they're learning a lot all the time about how metal works, just purely based on, on having different designs going through the raw mint all the time. They're learning sort of exciting things and, and one of the things is that that can cause quite a lot of stress on the dyes and eventually the dyes will fracture and break. To have a sort of an, a, a, an area of such high relief so close to the edge of the coin. So what they did, they would sort of contour the, the edge of this um, shield down a little bit so it wasn't quite so exaggerated. This was a particular point of the process where I was asked to, to give my opinion on um, a texture. I wanted the designs to have a texture within the, the shield so you, your eye can make some sort of sense of it to distinguish sort of space from substance and help um, piece it together. And it got to a point where the Royal Mint needed to um, engage a, a, with a dialogue with um, the government and uh, the Queen's household as well, because all designs in your pockets are signed off by those, by those two, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who has this sort of honorary title as, of Master of the Mint, and the Queen as well. They've, they've essentially, they've both got to sort of sign these off. And it went to Gordon Brown, who at the time he was Chancellor, and he was, he was fairly happy with them, he, he signed them off, and on they went to um, Buckingham Palace. And Buckingham Palace had a little sort of, a little issue with, with, with the concept, really. My, my concept was that, you know, the, the, the six coins come together, unite to form one design, you know, much like the four constituent parts of the UK unite to form the UK. I thought that was really, really positive. But there was a little bit of concern there that it could be sort of viewed the other way, that it could be viewed as a sort of a deconstruction of the UK. Um, so to sort of counter that um, nervousness, the, the Royal Mint introduced the pound as well in this, in this set. You might have seen it you know, in the first slide, and we'll see again in a minute, there's a pound that sits separately to the, to the other six coins, featuring the, the design in its entirety, sort of acting like the jigsaw box's lid sort of thing. Um, and these are the, the sort of the master dies being produced using a cutting tool, which again sort of traverses the surface um, and cutting into that metal, leaving a positive master die from which a female die would be produced and a male coin produced from that. So you're always working in sort of positive to negative to positive again, if that makes some sort of sense. Um, but it's not completely automated. There's still quite a lot of hand tooling goes in. As you, as you cut metal and as you cast from positive to negative and things like that, you, you, the design naturally 
becomes softer. So I think this image here is, some, uh, is a fella just sort of sharpening up some of the edges of the type. And after that long process, coins can be produced. And um, this is the final set. So there's the pound at the top. The series is quite similar, actually, to the first um, design I sent in. The, the 50p is in its lo same location, although it's rotated ever so slightly so that the echo, the, the, the point of the shield is echoed in the point of the coin. Um, and I think the, the 20p and penny swap places. And, but generally speaking, it's, it's fairly, fairly sort of similar. And they were launched um, in April 2008. So they've been around for a good long while now. Uh, and there was a great bit of press at the time. The, the Royal Mint tried to sort of get as much press coverage with this as they could. And the following day, the Times ran a front page with this design in it, and it was just astonishing. Um, there was some, I tried to record as much as I could of it, because it was on the TV at night, and I think Channel 5 featured it, and I had an interview with, with one of the guys there on the launch. And he also interviewed a kid on the street, and he said, oh, you know, little child, what do you think of these new designs? And the kid said, oh, they're cool. And that's just like the best kind of reaction I could ever have hoped for, really, because that's, you know, ultimately what I wanted people to, to think. You know, they're, they're a design that you can interact with and have some fun with, that people look at coins in a, in a new way, and maybe learn a little bit too. So, um, yeah, it, 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 was, it was great. They also picked up a, a DNAD black pencil, um, which is, you know, without that, that's you know, going to be the highlight of my um, professional career. It's not going to be uh, Echoes again. Um, and from there, there's been an all sort, you know, a really sort of interesting journey has kind of taken place. There's been future commissions by the Royal Mint. So for commemorative coins, they, what they do is they operate a little competition, normally involving sort of four or five or six designers or, or, or design agencies to come up with, um, with designs for coins, commemorating this, that and the other. So this is a 50 pence piece which commemorates 50 years of the WWF. Uh, this is a £2 coin commemorating 200 years since the birth of Charles Dickens, so it's a portrait formed from titles of his work. And then there's, there's sort of random approaches as well. So there was this project that I got involved in. So I, was, I, I had a call from the advertising agency, JWT, and they said, we've got, this, uh, we've got a client, HSBC, and HSBC sponsor the Hong Kong Rugby Sevens tournament every year or every other year. And we've got this idea in our minds that we need your help to sort of realise. So I think they probably just Googled, you know, like, coin design. And um, my name had come up and they picked up the phone. So I got involved with this. And it was, it was interesting because I had to sort of educate them a bit about the process. And it was obvious to me how much I'd learned along the way. Um, the, oh, sorry, I should say, sort of the concept behind this is, is serious play. So I don't know if you've ever been to like Rugby Sevens games, but they're, they're mental. They, they normally take place over a, a long weekend, uh, international tournaments composed of um, seven players on each side. And the crowd just turn up in fancy dress. Pretty much everyone is, you know, you're in a bunch of, of chickens over there or, or, you know, cavemen over there or, or sort of emperors over there and things like that. It's just, it's just brilliant. So the whole sort of experience is about play and having fun from the side of point of view of the fans, but also the serious side of the, of the rugby. So this serious play concept carried through to the coin, two sides. On one side was supposed to represent the serious nature of the rugby, and on the other side, the, the play. So that's how that sort of ended up being like that. And this was sort of um, an interim kind of stage in the design process as we were trying to uh, figure out, you know, what the characters are going to be, because you couldn't have characters like, you know, Mickey Mouse, because it's trademarked, it had to be sort of a theme, really. So to try and find six or seven different, different sort of themes to, to, to go on this um, medal um, was, was good fun. Um, and it was sort of epitomised with this, with this video here, uh, which they used in the stadium on the big screens, sort of at half-time intervals. Um, and when people weren't watching the rugby, they could go to the bars and they could flip this, this medal. And depending on whether it ended up serious or play, you know, you'd pay for drinks or the bartender would pay for drinks. So it was a proper kind of campaign and it won JWT a couple of awards. But this is the, um, the sort of the skit that they did that I'll just, that I'll just play.
So yes, yeah, so it was good fun. So kind of, I guess in, in conclusion, I think I've timed this fairly well, have I? So that's okay, good. So it's sort of in my experience, coin design is different every time. It, it all depends on the, on the brief and, and the best sort of outcome for that, particularly where the, regardless of what it's commemorating, it all sort of depends on that really. Um, there's always a challenge of working at such a small size. Um, and from that respect, it's, it's unique in terms of what we do. It's not like a piece of print or a, or a website. You're having to think about you know, a very, very, very small bit of design. And uh, working with metal you know, provides its own uh, interesting challenges and, and having to think about you know, design without, without colour as well. Um, but there's nothing like sort of the sense of seeing a finished kind of coin in your hand or a finished medal in your hand, having been through the process of producing it. It's really quite magical. Um, and, um, yeah, and the journey can be quite random at times as well. So that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, OK, so this is the way it works. I get to ask the first question. You've all busy, busily been scribbling notes because you're actively uh, campaigning to uh, ask the second question. But I'm going to kick off. And if you haven't thought of your first question, this is your moment, OK? Because I will randomly thrust this microphone in your hand. And those of you that have been here before know that that's the case. So um, I've got a starter question, Matt. Um, well, there's two parts to this. Um, because from 2003, a 2-2, to 2008, and a DNAD black pencil. And if you're not aware, DNAD black pencils are pretty much the one of the rarest awards in it's communication design. It's yeah. absolutely the highest. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Um, did, was there any... Um, and given that you, the following day after the launch, as you said, the, the, the coins were on the front of the Times, mm. did, were you given any sense of how much press there was going to be on this? Did, did the Royal Mint talk to you and say, this is really a big deal? I mean, OK, if you're being, you know, you've gone through a process that's seen 4,000 designs submitted, and it mm. must have been a pretty agonising process to be part of, to be then part of a a, a group that got smaller and smaller and smaller until it was just you and a handful of others. That must have been pretty stressful and quite exciting. But were you given any sense of this is going to be a really big deal or did that just all happen surprisingly for you? I think I got a fairly good sense it was going to be a, a large deal. They, they had, um, the Royal Mint had a, a PR agency at the time called Grayling and there was quite a bit of media training that I'd be doing with them, sort of, you know, what questions to answer, what questions to defer, what, what's a good thing to say and what's an absolutely awful thing to say sort of, you know, how um, a TV interview might differ to a telephone interview and all that kind of thing. So, so there was a bit of that. Um, there was quite a lot of nervousness because I think um, not long before the launch of this was the launch of the, um, the, the London Olympic Games 2012 identity. Yeah. And that went down like a dead puppy in a paddling pool, didn't it? And um, the agency just, just shut, shut down. Um, well, Follins, I think, just like, you know, just, just disappeared for, for a little while, went into a bunker. And I was sort of prepared to to do the same. They, they, there was a bit of a leak beforehand. They were so nervous about anyone sort of spilling the beans beforehand, but, but somehow I think the Daily Mail had found out that Britannia wasn't going to be on the new 50p. She wasn't going to be, she wasn't going to feature on the new coins in any, in any way. And I think they ran, um, they ran a bit of a campaign saying, oh, you know, whatever next, Jade Goody on the, on the pound and things like that, and a shopping trolley on the penny and, uh, and things like that. So they were, um, they sort of adopted a fairly negative approach even before the, the designs were announced. And there was a mixture. Um, I think um, the first sort of, the day after the launch was very factual. This is the news, this is what the designs represent. There wasn't really any opinion there. It was the following days, sort of day two onwards, where people sort of, you know, in the, in the dear sir column of the times and things like that, you'd have um, people's opinions. And on, on balance, it was positive. Yeah, on balance it was really positive, but um, yeah, there's always a bit of a mixture. Uh, so the second part of my question, which isn't really the second part, is a completely different question, but I wanted to ask it. Um, all right, given that at the start of your presentation you showed us some of the other work that you yeah. do, and there, um, I, I can remember the move that designers had to make when working in the digital realm, and people got very excited about designing websites for the first time, but then realised that those websites we're not going to be around for ever and mm. ever, and lots mm. of companies update their digital presence mm. pretty rapidly. Um, what was the? How did you feel about the responsibility you had 
when it came to the coins and the kind of longevity, because these things aren't designed to be disposable. They are designed to be in your pocket and to, mm. I don't know what the life expectancy is of a coin, but um, doing something that was going to have an impact oh, on, yeah, yeah. or an impact, ha play a part in everyone's yeah. lives, whether they realized it or not, the longevity. Was that a kind of pressure in the background or was it very much in the fore foreground? Uh, it was probably in the background. Um, it, was, it was fun because I went on this journey without any real expectation. It was a competition that I thought I'd you know, give it a try, nothing to lose. And, uh, and the journey sort of began like that. So I was, it, when, it, when it got to sort of like, you know, five designers left, that's when it sort of really sort of hit home. And, and when the designs would, would go from, you know, my computer and my mind to, to a three-dimensional plaster, you become significantly more attached to it then because you can sort of, you know, it's easier to imagine how it, how it, how it might be for real. So, um, so then I think there was, a, there was a pressure. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the, the runner-up design was um, a lovely series by um, David Gentleman. And David Gentleman, if you don't know him, he did the Charing Cross mural of all the people sort of producing the, the Charing Cross. It's uh, a, a woodcut design. And he had produced a, a lovely series based on the oak tree. And just before the, the, the designs were launched, the Conservatives rebranded. Re and they had a bit of a conservative... Well, they had a, um, a tree which, which looked a little oak tree-ish. Um, and there were also a few concerns with um, the history of Germanic coins using oak trees as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it just sort of fell in my lap, really, at the end. But, um, yeah, amazing. Thank you. Right, who would like the microphone? This is the bit where there's this deathly silence, and one or two people try not to catch my eye. And I, I recommend you do catch my eye, because be, it'll be the people not looking at me. I've thrust the microphone at. Yes, fantastic. There's always one, and then get that gets the ball off. I'm just curious for two things. Forgery, how, how does it work with coins? And also, how does the pay go? Do they pay well, since it's related to money? <laughs> how does that go? The, the second thing first, um, there, was, there was a fee attached to it. So the fee was £5,000 per coin. So I ended up doing seven, so it's thirty-five grand I got in the end, um, which went immediately on a, a deposit for a flat, um, never to be seen again. <laughs> and... Uh, and um, Forgery, yes, it's a, an issue with the higher denominations more so. So you have the, uh, the bimetallic two-pound coin with the, with the two colours of metal. So that's an anti-forgery device. Um, and the, there's a consultation pro process on the go at the moment for the pound coin to, uh, to follow suit. So as well as it being bimetallic, it might have 12 sides as well and various other um, sort of anti-forgery um, security devices as well. So... There was a competition that I think closed in October last year to find new designs for the new specification pound. So sort of my pound will, no, will cease to exist, really. It will be superseded by a new design. Um, so, so, yeah. It's but, uh, forgery is not within the design. It's within the composition of the metals and all that. No, no. It's not really anything that the individual designers have to okay, consider. Okay. Um, sort of the... the, the the, the, f the funny thing was that quite a lot of um, my specification, my design pound, has been um, reproduced illegally, which is, which is quite exciting. <laughs> so I think it's sort of like a, a bit of a pat on the back that the forgers are, are, are out there trying to mimic it, which is good. And can you tell that you have one in your pocket? No, I don't think so. They, they say the sort of, you know, vending machines, the ones that they spit out, they might be the, the forged ones, but... You know, I look at them fairly closely and they look all right to me. But there's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's sort of like, you know, a couple in every hundred or uh, up to five in every hundred might be counterfeited. And it's, it's quite a high number, really. So that's why there's pressure to bring in a new um, uh, high regulated coin. Good question. Yeah. Hi, so regarding the one pound, and how you spoke it was introduced much later yeah. after the whole, you know, the ones put together. And was yeah. that your idea? Was that something you were asked to get that forward? Was it something you were happy with, basically? It was something I was, uh, yeah, good question. It was something I, I was happy with because it was an extra coin. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, yeah, that, a, little bit, a little bit more, <laughs> a bit more money. Um, yeah. But initially, the the reason that the pound wasn't in the brief to begin with, and the two pound coin as well, is because they, they, the Royal Mint have a series, a sort of like a program, 
a design program. So they tend to go every, every year they might release a new pound with a new sort of uh, theme on it. So I think for four years running they had bridges, for four years running they had capital cities. So they have, uh, you know, quite a few years in advance, they have a theme that they're working towards. So that's why the, those coins were, were, were not included. There was a thought that the 50p could also be the, the coin featuring the design as a whole. But I never really liked that idea because there's already a 50p in the design, so it seemed a bit of a messy um, solution in the end. But, but they went with a pound, which was great. But it wasn't um, my suggestion. There was, I think there were a lot of conversations behind the scenes, okay. um, fairly, sort of, you know, fairly sort of high up levels of management about this, this, this um, process because they had so much riding on it, the Raw Mint. They're, they're a, a commercial institution. They have to run at profit. They're not sort of government subsidised. Um, uh, and they're so sort of highly regulated and they need to be signed off in, you know, in by, by Gordon Brown, the Chancellor of Exchequer and, and the Queen's household. The reason that the competition took so long, sort of 18 months, two years, and the reason they had so many designs whittled down so slowly was to just sort of, just to make sure that they ar were arriving at a design that they were happy with. Um, and I think that was the, the final thing that they just needed to, to do to, to, to get it over the line, really. Mm. Excellent. Any other questions? I think we've got time for one more. I'm kind of happy to ask this. I just randomly put my hands in my pockets and I'm, I'm rich to the tune of 10 pounds and 12 pence. And my 10 pence piece, oh, without even thinking this, thinking about this at all, is going to be a design. Hurrah. So my question now is related to that. But back to that longevity, but how does it feel that you designed something that a good professor would have yeah. got yeah. about the Yeah, I've been asked that since sort of day one, and it's the hardest yeah. question to answer. Um, it, it's, it's nutty. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's really bizarre. I, I feel a sort of a, a companionship with them. You know, when you see them on the, on the floor, it might be a penny or something, you know, lying in a bit of a puddle of urine or something, but it's like, <laughs> I, can see, I can see it's got my design on it, so what am I going to do? It's quite... It's a tricky one. So I'm, I'm awfully fond of them. Um, uh, and it, and it is, it's crazy to sort of see them used. It was, it was interesting sort of in the years after them being launched. They've been ran as sort of projects by primary schools. Um, my sister-in-law was a primary school teacher for a while and she ran one of these projects. And it was sort of to her primary school group, you know, what would you like to sort of see on the, on the coin? So as part of this project, they learned a bit about coins and, and value and heraldry and design and... Also, they were sort of challenged as to what they'd like to see, and the response was, was you know, wide, we you know, very wide wearing and, and brilliant. You know, when I think there was like a, the kids were really into Doctor Who at the time, so there was Doctor Who on them, or, or guns, you know, on the, or there'd be a, a, maybe a little sort of a little knife on the penny, but it would work its way up to a bazooka on the 50p. <laughs> kind of thing. So it's really lovely concepts. Yeah. Um, Matt. Thank you.